Welcome to Positive Perspectives on Accounting. My name is Leona Wiegmann. And my name is Lukas Koretsky. And in today's episode, we will deal with a question that concerns many in our Positive Perspectives on Accounting community, namely what will the future of controlling and the controller look like? And to answer this burning question, we have invited an expert whose job it is to envision the future of controlling. Our guest today is Jochen Fellhauer from SAP. Jochen will help us to shed light on the future of the controlling function. More precisely, we will learn what the future controller will look like, what role an agile approach and ambidexterity can play in the controlling function, and what accounting educators can do differently to prepare graduates for a career as controller. That sounds exciting. Let's dive into this episode. Jochen, thank you very much for joining us in this episode. Before we delve deeper into today's topic, could you please tell us a bit about yourself and your role at SAP? Yeah, thanks a lot, Leona, and thanks a lot for having me today. Um, a really cool uh, opportunity. Yeah, my name is Jochen Fellauer. I'm an organizational development expert and HR coach at SAP, and I'm part of the controlling leadership team. And um, as a small team, we are currently driving the transformation of controlling at SAP towards an agile controlling organization. Um, myself, I'm now a bit more than 20 years, 21 years with the company. And uh, the last six years now, I'm within controlling. And uh, before I held various totally different roles actually in, in the company. So my, let's say, hobbies or what I'm passionate about um, are currently agile concepts. Um, so that pretty much relates, obviously, to, to my role. Um, I did a lot of design thinking um, approaches before, also um, lean uh, introduction in, in company and, and the administration processes, especially. Uh, and I'm also a, a certified change management consultant. Thank you, Jochen. This sounds super interesting. Not every company has organizational development uh, experts like you. One of your main topics you're working on in this role is to make the finance or controlling function future ready. How do you tackle this challenge? What are your main sources of information when it comes to imagining the future of controlling? Yeah, so um, I think we have a tough couple of different approaches here. Uh, first of all, I think we, we invest a lot of time since years in continuously exchange with a lot of partners, actually. Um, of course, with our customers, first of all, right? So um, as a controlling functional expert, uh, we are heavily involved in discussions with customers. Um, so to, to have also an, an inbound channel What, what they require in sense of future development and um, to, to see um, whether the common ground is in sense of where, where should we develop as a, a finance organization and how can we support in general companies. Um, so that is a big portion of it. Um, we are also since quite a while quite heavily engaged with um, certain universities, um, especially in, in Germany, um, that um, do some, some science and research around the development. Um, and uh, we are also very active in a couple of associations like International Controller Association, International Controller Verein in uh, Germany based. Um, so second, we spend a lot of time in observing also the technical development and, and the roadmap in the finance technology. I mean, that's a bit easier in, in our company, right? So we are, um, so that is basically the, the heart of what, what our software development teams um, are doing. Um, so we um, are in close discussion with our um, internal product owners uh, and the development teams, but also the, the futurists to see really the, the, the bigger perspective of, of that. Um, and um, also especially with the analytics cluster. But we also observe the, the trends and the new concepts in, in real life, right? So um, to see how we in our day-to-day -day life um, 
interact with digital devices, how we digitalize our personal life, right? Um, and also how other service functions develop uh, um, that, that are all also influence factors, which we, we bake in to, to, let's say, come up with an idea of what, what the future in five or 10 years will look like. And you have clearly given a lot of thought to the future of controlling. So let's uh, dive a little bit deeper into that topic. From your perspective, what will the role of the controller look like in, let's say, 10 years from now? So first of all, um, I must admit that that a 10 years horizon is pretty hard, um, actually, at, at the moment, I, I would say. Um, so what what is more predictable? is for sure the, the road to 10 years. So everything that happens between now and in 10 years, that's already quite predictable from, from my perspective. Um, beyond, mm, I don't know, really 100%, but for sure there are some, some ideas. Um, there are a couple of uh, quite interesting technology topics on, on the road. Um, like conversational AI that that might have quite disruptive, quite disruptive uh, potential, I would say, also for for us in controlling. I think common sense is already that um, all kinds of transactional tasks will be fully taken over by technology. Um, some some concrete examples. I think hardly anyone in controlling will run a report and and, and copy results over to a PowerPoint slide and, and send that to management in, in 10 years from now, right? So a business manager in 10 years from now, um, they they won't con uh, uh, contact or call controlling for a figure, right? Um, they will just simply ask the mobile app, uh, what, what is the headcount figure or how is sales going in, in a region A, A, B, C in uh, the quarter three or something like this. This will be fully automated. Um, what is now increasingly important definitely um, is um, everything around um, defining algorithms, tools, defining user interfaces, and, and to act as translation layer, a sort of interface between the, the business needs and the, and, uh, the financial context and uh, bring that into um, technology requirements. And, and this is where you already see that um, in the past three years, five years, maybe um, all the bigger companies invested a lot um, in, in increasing capacity, controlling capacity on, on that topic. I mean, um, for, for ourselves, for example, um, we have even created our own organization units um, specialized on, on, on that to come up and define and create uh, financial assets. Yeah, um, maybe some more um, future aspects. Um, so what, what I think um, we will, and, and to summarize, have this trans, uh, um, translation layer, a business into um, business administration context into IT, that's one. Um, second, in 10 years from now, I, my personal opinion is that we will see on the one hand side a very high value business partnering function, um, more kind of a strategic financial business partner, um, which is very, very knowledgeable around the challenges and the business um, that she or he supports. And um, the value add of this business partner will be to really discuss, challenge the business and translate it into um, a finance context, right? Um, and to um, support decisions basically in, in that area. Um, and a third aspect that I see in 10 years from now um, with a very high demand um, is everything around creativity, communication and change management, also for, for controllers or especially from controllers. And that might differ uh, most from um, what a controller typically did like 10 years back, right? Um, so this is already changing now, but, but uh, this communication and change management aspects, um, I think will become uh, tremendously more important um, in, in the future. 
And when you look at the profiles of controllers, where do you see a need for change in their skills, their competencies, or even the mindset in order to become future ready? Yeah, I think mindset is the, the most important aspect in, in that. Um, so we, we did an analysis uh, recently with our leadership team um, and to review our skills and competency profiles for, for our controllers. And um, what we have seen actually is if you look on the pure map of skills, um, you won't see that harsh difference to, to the future. So um, if, if you just compare it on a qualitative basis, there, there is not so much change. Right? So you have now new um, topics on in, into, into analytics and IT and, and those stuff and R, and we know that. Um, but um, a lot of the, the legacy things that have been important in the past are still on, right? Um, and, um, and the change that happens in, in the quality. So people need still the same skills, but they will execute it on a different quality um, with the business. And you spend um, a lot of um, different capacity on different topics, right? So, so the emphasis of, of certain skills um, will, will change, right? And um, so I, I mentioned now a couple um, of things already. Um, so if you um, look on, on the business partnering side, you will see that and going into a high value and high level business discussion um, will be much more in focus in comparison to, to really detailed calculation schemes, right? So you will have a, a couple of experts that develop this, that very detailed uh, calculation schemes, right? Um, but, but then um, a business partner won't need to understand that in every detail, but uh, just get the context and the and, and the principle behind and, and then the emphasis is can I translate that into a story to the business right can I um, interpret the what I hear from the business and bring it back to to the to to my colleagues that translate that into models that that is the more interesting emphasis right and you touch upon an interesting aspect here will the future controller be more of a specialist focusing on very specific task or task areas or do you rather see that the future controller will be a generalist working with very, very different topics and issues? What is your view on that? So um, from my perspective, we, we see both. So that um, financial um, business partner, um, that, that is for sure more a generalist, right? So everything that is going more into the direction of a business partner uh, will remain a generalist. I think we will see a couple of very specialized role in controlling. Um, so the the one um, are the the ones that um, are focusing more on that that IT related topics, right? To train machine learning al algorithms, um, build statistical models, um, topics like. Like that, um, those um, are now increasingly important also in, in our uh, organization, right? And, and those uh, colleagues are very um, specialized in, in, in their topic and in, in the statistical methods and, and so on that's behind. And third, I think there will be still um, a few very specialized um, very exclusive round of business administration specialists, right? That, that really knows the details of accounting and, and the procedure and the regulations. Um, but those, those very specific knowledge is, is not needed any longer uh, with every controller that supports a, a business partner. Those very specific skills will be centralized in um, COEs, and um, those will drive and develop concepts that then are applied in, in the entire company. Right? Another topic that is very close to your heart is making the controlling function agile. I think a lot of people have heard the term, but don't really know what that means. Could you explain us what that means and what it specifically means in the context of controlling? 
Yeah. So maybe I start with what what it's not and and what we don't mean, right? Um, so uh, maybe a, a kind of the biggest misunderstanding is that um, when we started to talk about agile in, in finance, people understood Scrum, right? So we are a software development company, and um, in in our a, a lot of people in our company are used to a certain agile framework, Scrum, that basically says like um, you you slice the problem in into reasonable chunks and and you um, have a certain defined time frame of let's say two to three four weeks and um, then you are very concentrating on on certain aspects you bring that to a definite end and then you start the next so-called sprint and take the next part of the problem right um so and when when we started to talk about hl um our um, people thought we would now try to implement that Scrum framework into controlling day-to-day -day the job. And obviously, this does not necessarily fit very, very nicely, right? Um, so we are not talking about Scrum when we talk about HR. What we did actually is um, that we um, took a look at the, at the principles, at the basic ideas behind Agile. So um, if you look back to, to the um, origin, uh, which is, by the way, in the, in the software industry, um, they, they come up with a very thin um, uh, manifesto on, on that. And we orient very much on, on that, right? And um, so the, the basic ideas is um, to respond to change over following a plan, to set customer interaction over contract negotiation, um, to have really um, tangible results over comprehensive documentation and to emphasize more on individuals and interaction um, compared to purely focus on processes and tools. Um, and, and that is the level where we try to, to access and um, what the GFA organization, also the finance and um, uh, administration board area in our company did, they translated all those agile software development principles into the finance organization. And we try to build up on those uh, principles. That's basically the, the foundation where, where we have uh, started. So now, and our first step is now um, that focusing on, on the value of the customer, right? Um, and customer in sense of our internal um, customers that we serve with, with um, controlling services and to really get people a bit away from focusing on, on that handbook-like processing, but to really ask, okay, what is now the problem of my business counterpart? What is her challenge? What, what, which decision do, does, does she need to take now, right? Um, and to orient in every service that we provide to those kind of business questions first, right? So, so this is the basic attitude that we want to bring into our um, controlling organization. And therefore, we, uh, for instance, did a, a real bold move and re we really organize now our controlling organization around internal customer segments, not any longer around the uh, organizational structure of the company, but really to think about which kind of manager have quite similar problems to solve. And around these pro business problems, we organize now controlling teams and support that. Um, and um, this is, the 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 first and uh, one of the most important changes towards an, an agile organization to really think always in in the mind of, of the customer and our second is um that uh, the the that that we adapt also our working method and, and styles to to some of the principles like um continuous and iterative delivery um, of of topics, um, constant real prioritization, also being quite transparent on 
um, what we are working on, what we are prioritizing on, what we don't do, right? So that is also a quite important um, aspect in, in Agile. Um, and so over time, um, we we continue um, now to to foster that mindset really in in the organization. So I, I think mindset is is one of the most important terms in in that context. You talked about two aspects: the organizational structure and the mindset. Is it enough to just change the structure, or what does it need for a controller to become agile? How do you drive this change and? How do you realize the potential of agile and the controlling function? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so um, of course it's it's not done with with a reorganization, but but the uh, reorganization helped us to to break with some very established processes and um, formalized um, things in in the organization and. Um, so this was a like a door opener to to really come up with with new concepts and, and ideas, and um, so how do we drive that now in the organization? We have a set of agile coaches that support now um, on the one hand side um, line managers um, and um, we talk with them about their uh, controlling business challenges. Um, and um, they try to match them with agile concepts, right? Like um, simple example, I have problems in my team with um, with capacity constraints. Um, so, and, and then one answer could be, okay, do you have transparency? Oh, not really. Oh, okay. So maybe it's worthwhile to to um, get the team together um, on a regular basis, maybe once, twice a week. Um, maybe you, you put up a board where you map who's working on what, and um, you also make quite uh, visible where, where there is um, too much load on, on one resource, right? And, and then people can, can shift and take over, and they can together prioritize, right? To say, okay, we, we see now we have, um, Five topics on the plate for the for this week. Uh, five important business cases, but we we cannot solve everything. So, what is our answer as a team? What to focus on, and what is the communication back to the business to say, okay, look, your two topics will now pause for two weeks because in the next two weeks we will concentrate um, on uh, the the other three topics, right? Um, or Let's say to 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 level also the 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 service that you bring, right? So maybe sometimes um, it's it's not only a question about if you do it or if you do it not, but but if you um, if if you do it like uh, with ten hours invest versus maybe uh, with two hours you come to an eighty percent um, solution, which is fair enough to continue with the business, right, to, to, to foster that kind of conversation and um, to, to really make people focus on, on the right topics. That is something that um, is an agile principle and that you can pretty much apply it to, to a controlling business from my perspective, really. And of course, the most easiest one is anyhow, any kind of project formats. And we, we talk a lot about digitalization in the controlling organization. And here, of course, all these agile project formats uh, perfectly apply also to, to our um, reality. And, and this is now um, already a commodity in, in our organization to do that in an agile uh, way. That sounds like a lot of change that is going on in your organization. What would you say are the biggest outcomes or implications of an agile approach for the business, the organizational culture, and the controlling function? Of course, there is also, let's say, um, a price you have to pay, right? Um, so we we will not any longer in, invest in too much individualization of services, right? So that, that is where we have been coming from to have very high sophisticated uh, services specialized to to um, really single managers then in the company. Um, and um, this is definitely something that that we have decided to cut um, and to 
set the priorities on a different level to, to say, okay, what, what is important for the company and for a number of managers? And uh, we um, ex accept that um, you have certain important business challenges, which we are happy to support, but we will not support you in your personal preference if, if the color um, of the figure is, is red, blue, or um, something else, right? And, and this, um, I love to have Word instead of PowerPoint or Excel or whatever, that, that sort of preferences on an individual basis, we, we will not pursue any any longer, right? So this is the, the thing where, where um, we, we have seen changes, but which is also um, quite accepted after a short period of time in, in the business to see, okay, I get I get a, a perfect quality for, for the real decisions that I need to take as a business manager. And, and this is what they are really specializing in um, and where they are coming up with interesting new tools, which makes me a bit more um, independent of the question, um, is my controller currently in the same time zone than I am so that I can call him directly on the mobile phone? Oh, okay, I have a dashboard. I have the answer right away also by one click on my tablet, right? And and so they see also the, the benefits on, on their end. And of course, we, um, let's say, limit um, the individual personal service to the level where it make sense for the company and where we have impact. That, that is something that, that uh, really changes. Um, also from a, um, it, it is a higher challenge for the individual, right? Um, so it's, it's not enough to just follow the standard procedure like you used to, to uh, do in, in the past 10 years. Um, and I think a lot of companies have, have that situation that some sort of controller support over years, same business, and then you follow your your um, handbook. And um, so now it's it's really also a bit out of the com comfort zone to say, okay, what what is now? Um, what not, not the question is not what keeps me busy. The question is what is most value add to the company, and to also challenge myself um, and challenge the business. Um, on, a, on a regular basis on, on, on that topic, right? And, and then drive standardization automation uh, out, of, of, out of this insights. Yeah? And um, this is also a, a different attitude. And to say no from time to time. <laughs> Thinking about the individual controller, it sounds like what has been considered a good performance of a controller in the past will not be considered a good performance in the future. Could you reflect on what an agile approach in the controlling function means for the performance evaluation of a controller? The value add for the business, and this is not an easy one, um, but, but this is really what, what we want to um, increase with becoming an agile controlling organization, really to concentrate on what, what is the problem of the business and, and what is the value add that we can contribute and, and help the, the manager in the business to, to solve um, her problems, right? Um, so a, a concrete or a, a, let's say ultimate measure would be to measure this value we, we bring in solving of the, the business problem. Um, and um, maybe something on, on that way is a measure of effectiveness do we invest our capacity on the right topics? Uh, that, that could be something. Um, and do we produce really effective concrete outcomes, right? Um, it's, it's not enough to, to remain busy on the right things. You And this is also agile. You need to deliver on a constant basis really value to your customers. In our case, this is the internal um business manager right so um does she get something from our support that helps her not in 12 months time but in the next quarter and maybe it's not perfect but it's one step forward and then in the next quarter you get a bit more um and we have a constant discussion on the quality and, and the additional needs right this is also agile to have that iterative and integrative um approach right in, instead of um 
collecting a bunch of requirements and, and go back in, in your workshop and then come back in, in, in 12 months time with a solution that might not fit. No, you, you are in a constant discussion with your business partner and constantly improve the tools you, you deliver and the concepts and, and what so on. Um, and uh, so measure this effectiveness would, would be something. In our case, definitely um, the level of standardization and automation for the current um, transformation phase in which we are in is an um, important measure. Um, and maybe an interesting one, you could also think about measuring what you don't do any longer. Right, so um, that uh, you also show to the people, okay, um, it's not additional things that you do. Just so you you also get rid of some things, and th this is, from my perspective, also the um, the the beauty in 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 the messaging to to everyone that that sees now that that change in the role. Right, where I say, okay, we we lose hopefully a lot of these transactional low value adding tasks and you can focus a lot more capacity on a lot of things that are required from controlling so um and and to see that change and to to see okay i'm i'm also increasing my um, value contribution and also um my recognition then at the end in in the organization And um, I, I hope that we can also support that, uh, maybe even with cool, cool measures, and, and can make that transparent. I mean, we, we are controllers, so <laughs> that should be feasible to, to come up with some sort of measuring, measuring on, on that, right? You said a few times could and would. I guess that means that you haven't changed everything that you have outlined yet. Have you already changed something in the performance evaluation of controllers to support your agile approach? Definitely, we we have changed um, in the entire company um, the um, at least the option for for individuals um, to be measured on on the company success rather than on a very artificial um, single success. And I would say this is definitely also. Um, Uh, uh, not only controlling limited, but an uh, uh, entire company-wide um, step to say, okay, it's um, it's it's important that you contribute individually, but at the end, um, what what makes us successful is um, the the success of the entire company, and and that's what we collectively need to work on. And um, so, in in that sense, yes, yeah. Um, if we uh, um, let's say have broken that down. Um, yes and no, not to um, some some sort of very creative measures, but what we also do now um, is um, since beginning of the year to, to have a qualitative uh, steering also in the finance organization with the introduction of uh, OPR method, objectives and key results, um, where we in line with the company strategy overall define where do we need to head from a finance organization and what are our key results on that way and who is contributing in which to which extent on, on the single objectives and uh, contributing with which key results. So it, yes, in that sense, also we, we changed already how we steer our organization. In a presentation that you gave to the International Control Association, you talked about ambidexterity and how controlling functions need to adopt an ambidexterous approach. And we were wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on what exactly that means and also give us some examples of how SAP works with ambidexterity in their controlling function. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, basically... Um, It's it's just a matter of reality um, that we see. On the one hand side, we have a lot of business pressure that ask for more effectiveness of, of our services, right? So uh, we live in a VUCA world. Um, we have uh, real short um, cycles in change of technology, in change of who are the competitors in the market, <clears throat> so is, there is a high pressure on our business to constantly 
react and foresee changes and adapt the organization. And the heart of controlling is to help the company to steer towards a change goals, right? And um, in, so the last two years um, have demonstrated that um, almost all com companies um, have the high need to, to constantly readjust and, and to face situations that they haven't had on, on the radar, right? Um, and um, so this is the increase in, in quality of services and the increase in, in effectiveness. On the other hand side, of course, there is also constant pressure um, on the profitability of, of companies. Um, and we are in a finance organization, um, in general, a supporting function. We are not um, a, a, a revenue generating function. And um, in, in this case, obviously, the, there is always a contribution of a finance organization and a controlling organization to become more um, efficient. And um, to show also the, the stretch, um, in the past 10 years, SAP grew by around about 50% in sense of people. And uh, at the same time, um, we support that with 25% less um, people in their core finance department. Um, and that shows actually also the, the high pressure um, to become really more um, efficient as a finance organization and to do um, or provide our contribution to increasing effectiveness of the entire um, organization. And um, this is this makes it quite obvious that that you you increase the quality and effectiveness um, and decrease um, the the invest in at the same time and at that topic. And um, th this is the the situations that that we uh, describe with that ambidextrous um, organization. And the answer from us, and we think that. Um, our HR concepts can really um, help to address this challenge, this contradicting situation, right? And I, two, two examples here. So um, to step away from um, an individual uh, focus on, on controlling towards a segment base um, brings both so um, we, we reduce the effort for, let's say, a number of people individually, but we still analyze what is then the net net that really drives the needle for, for those, for, for this group of managers. And, and for this group of managers, we are ready to, to then really invest in, in a different service, in a different dashboard, um, but it's not only serving one manager, it's serving maybe ideally 50 managers and uh, so we we have a certain um uh, scale um in 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 that and and this is how we um want to drive that in the future and um face that challenge yeah. you talked about that on the one hand you try to make processes more stable if you want in controlling so you want to standardize them focus on efficiency gains But on the other hand, you also talk about the VUCA world that controllers find themselves in. So a world that is volatile, that is uncertain, that is complex, that is ambiguous, where it is very difficult to standardize processes and practices. So how do controllers experience this VUCA element of their work and to what extent do they feel comfortable with it? Maybe that's a bit provocative, but... Uh... I would say it, it makes our uh, job even more interesting, right? So um, if, if everything is going streamlined and um, you don't see too much change, I mean, then the, the machine can take over uh, that, that, in, that, that, that prediction part. And um, so there is not so much creativity, creativity that, that you need to, to, to see that, but... But um, those sorts of pretty major interesting challenges now is the, the, the situation where, where the machine can only support you with, with some data facts insights. And now on top of that, you need to come up with um, 
um, your creativity, um, your ability to observe what's, what's going on and, and then find some solution on that really challenging situation and, and come up with proposals um, that support your, your business counterpart to, to take decisions, right? And so I would state like this really makes um, that, that, that change in the roles are different, right? And it, as you said, right, if you are uncomfortable with all of that, then it gets quite hard in the future because the thing that you described with the, the, the stable procedures, um, all those can pretty much be covered with, with technology. Where you remain important and get even more important is, is now that, that part um, where, where the, the predictable um, thing ends, right? And, and this is um, the part where also uh, VUCA is, is one of, of the big things to, to deal with. If you would be standing in our classroom in front of a group of students who want to become controllers, what would be your message or your advice to them? What can they do in order to prepare themselves for this VUCA world you were talking about, this more wild water rafting type of controlling that seems to wait them? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe um, a kind of um, old school message first. Um, a good business administration background is still very important, right? Um, so this is something that I learned over time. So my university time is now two decades back, uh, but I still um, leverage what I learned at that time. Um, and you can always bring it back to some of the basic concepts, right? That's that's good if you, you have, have a, a sound base on, on which you grow. Other than that, I think most important um, is this attitude of continuous learning and change. You cannot expect that you learn now a set of techniques, knowledge, and, and then this will last for 20, 30 years. Um, so I'm, I think a, a good example. So I, I changed four times um, completely my role in SAP. I, I did four times totally different things. Um, everything I did had some relation back to the roots where I came from, but, but um, I, I needed to learn totally different things every like four to five years. And um, this will remain um, even if you stay in controlling, right? Uh, then maybe the, the magnitude of the difference is not so high, but, but still you will see a constant change and you will constantly need to learn new things and to have a growth mindset and, and to also acknowledge that every time you meet people, you have the ability to learn from, from their perspective um, and to, to have the ability to, to absorb that and, and to make it yours if it fits. Uh, that is maybe the, the most important um, aspect. And a very concrete thing, of course, for, for the next 10 years, um, anything in, in um, IT and analytics statistics will be very, very relevant in, in the next 10 years in, in this discipline um, and having statistical um, knowledge, knowing about AI um, and um, having really good understanding of um, all that theoretical backgrounds helps you a lot, even though you, hardly anyone needs to really then sit down and, and program it. But to understand what's happening on, on, on the other side of the fence, on, on the IT side, uh, helps you a lot to translate and to prepare your needs and requirements for them so then they can really implement on it. And, and so if you are able to combine business and administration and IT and statistics, um, that, that is currently definitely a sweet spot, which is uh, a brilliant asset if you hit the, the labor market in, in the next five to 10 years. And when you talk to the educators, is there something where you feel that they could change with respect to how they teach controlling, how they talk about controlling? So coming from my own experience, um, it, it was sometimes hard for me to, 
relate what I've learned in back in university, what is happening really in, in companies in, in reality. Um, and to, um, let's say, expose people to, to that situation and um, let them experience and translate and to foster also that translation um, of, of the students to say, okay, explain me what, what did you see in, in that company um, and uh, what is the process? How, how does it relate to which aspects of, of theory? Where did you see gaps? Also, this is quite interesting, right? Um, and I think that helps a lot um, to, to get that connection between theory and, and practice. And I think this is uh, most important to, to train people in, in that behavior, to always reflect, what do I see now in, in reality? And uh, does it match somehow something that I've learned or not? And if not, why? Um, how can we get closer? Or is there a good reason? Um, and um, I, I would state that this is um, an, an interesting um, aspect from a me methodology, uh, methodology um, that, that I would see. Other than that, I see definitely the challenge with all that new things. So if you see the skills um, and uh, acknowledging that um, you don't sort out a lot of skills, but, but you add basically for the future controller skills, um, so to, to teach now also these additional topics on top to what you used to have, uh, this is uh, definitely a, a quite interesting challenge. Yeah, exactly. Because you, you mentioned before that in controlling, sometimes you need to get rid of certain tasks uh, in order to make space for new ones. And the same might apply to our curriculum. So what do you think can we maybe take away from our classes in order to make space, make room for new topics? Maybe it's a question on which level of detail do you need on which topic, right? Um, and to give um, students also the possibility to concentrate um, on a small number of things where they really go into deep. So I remember when, when I calculated network diagrams in project planning. Yeah, you never do that in 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 uh, reality. I uh, also calculated um, those uh, relationship diagrams and and things like that in detail for hours um, and and spent hours in 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 lessons who at, at the whiteboard um, draw the calculation. And um, so I, I, th there will always be a need for a lot of people or for, for some people to, to be expert in, in this one, but, but not like 98%, right? And to, to um, make a conscious decision on what is really relevant for like 80% to, to know that and, and uh, what needs to be applied. And then to acknowledge, okay, I have 20% of really cool people deep diving in, in any detail um, and to have separate offerings for, for them, that would be my recommendation. Thank you very much, Jochen, for all these insights and for contributing to our positive perspective on accounting community. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. And I'm very much looking forward to continue that discussion. That will be a very interesting journey in the next couple of years. And um, hopefully I can come back and we can talk about the, the progress uh, maybe in a, in a uh, couple of months um, or one, two years. That would be very interesting. Those were very interesting insights from Jochen about the future of the controller and agile approach and the dexterity in the controlling function and also what we as educators can do differently in the future. Indeed, and uh, considering Jochen's view towards the future of controlling, it looks like controllers have a bright future ahead of them, don't they? Well... At least if they have a mindset of embracing change. Jochen emphasized how important it is that controllers need to be willing to constantly learn new skills and practices to adapt to the developments that the future holds for their companies. Yeah, but what seems to follow from this is that controllers can leverage the changes that go along with digitalization 
to make their jobs even more interesting and more relevant. The fact that companies like SAP have experts whose professional role it is to envision the future shows the relevance of this topic. This provides interesting opportunities for joint knowledge creation between accounting and control practitioners and scholars. That means there are fascinating and exciting future research projects awaiting for us, Lucas. On that note, happy accounting. Happy accounting, everyone.